So, good afternoon from a not so sunny Edinburgh. In fact, the guy in the radio said Edinburgh's going to have 100% humidity. To me, that means it's going to be raining, and he's not wrong. So here we are, we're at the top of the Royal Mile, we've had a lot of requests. Finally, we are at Edinburgh Castle. What's the difference between a castle and a palace? Because we have both. A castle is generally used for defensive purposes. In the olden days, it was always under attack. And indeed, Edinburgh Castle is the most besieged castle in Britain. Quite possibly in Europe, up to, up to 30 sieges took place in this castle. And if you look to both sides of me, you're going to see two of our national heroes. We've got William Wallace on this side. You know William Wallace from Braveheart. Remember that? Remember Mel Gibson in that movie? Probably the worst Scottish accent in the world. Mel, if you're listening, please come to me. Let's consult about your Scottish accent. We can work on that one. So William Wallace defeated Edward I at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. He himself was then captured, taken down to London, and he was hung drawn and quartered, and parts of his body was put all over the country as a warning to us, the Scots, not to get uppity again. However, we did, because then, in 1314, we have Robert the Bruce, again, who defeated the son of Edward I, Edward II, at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. We have long memories in this country. And above me, you'll see our national motto, so all you Latin scholars, get your books out. You'll see Nemo, me in pun, lacesset. Which translates as, nobody touches me with impunity. Or you could say, who dares meddle with me? Or in modern Scots, modern English, hit me and I'm going to hit you back even harder. So well, we get asked a lot of questions. The first question we usually get asked is, how old is Edinburgh Castle? Well, that's a question that really tour guides kind of have a difficulty with that one because when you look at it first off, you, people always think it was built all at the same time. But that's not true. There's been archaeological evidence of habitation on the rock upon which the castle is built, going back to about 3000 AD. So Iron Age, Bronze Age artifacts have been discovered here. But the castle itself has been destroyed under its sieges, been bombarded, it's been rebuilt under many, many occasions. In fact, Robert the Bruce asked for the castle to be destroyed so that it could not be used as a place of refuge for the English after the war. So it couldn't be used by the English at all. So he destroyed it. The only, the only part he left was the oldest part of the castle, which is in here, and it's St. Margaret's Chapel. St. Margaret's Chapel dates back to the 12th century. That's the oldest part. But each monarch who lived here decided to build other structures. So the kings, mainly the Stuarts, so they've got James, James IV, V, all the way to the 6th added new structures to the castle itself. Mike's going to talk a little bit more, more about the contents of the castle, what you see when you're in here. But James VI was the last monarch who actually lived in here. And he's quite relevant because he was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. If you remember the story between Elizabeth and Mary, when Queen Elizabeth of England died, she left no issue, she had no children. So it was Mary's son, James VI of Scotland, who then became James I of England. So the crowns became united in the early 1600s. In here we keep the, the crown jewels of Scotland and Mike is going to talk about them a little bit later. But the, what you're looking at here, the facade, this is added on during the Victorian period. So the castle's been continually updated and upgraded throughout history. So when we say, when you see it, tell us how old it is, we will always say, well, the oldest part of the castle dates back to the 12th century. And it's a little chapel dedicated to St. Margaret or Queen Margaret. Now, if I just walk around here, you'll get an idea of what we call the castle esplanade. This is a parade ground. So I do a full 360 and you get the esplanade here. Now it's here in August, under normal circumstances, that Edinburgh hosts the Edinburgh Military Tattoo. Now tattoo, I know you're all thinking tattoos on your arms, 
No, we're not talking about tattoos. Tattoo comes from the Dutch tap toe. Tap toe was when the buglers would bugle out, give, give their announcements that everything was closing. It'd be when the barmen would close the bar, so the soldiers were called back to their barracks. In the States, you call it taps. We call it tap toe. Tap toe we corrupted into tattoo. So actually on this particular area here, at the beginning of May, in normal circumstances, they build an 8,000 seat stadium to host the Edinburgh Military Tattoo. Google Edinburgh Military Tattoo and you'll see. Some people who go here think it's the best show they've ever seen. I would highly recommend it. It's for the whole of August. Hi ladies, how are you doing? Hi. Where are you from? Australia. Australia? Yeah. Wow, we're doing a live broadcast. Say hi to everybody. Hello. <laughs> Say hi to your mates in Australia. Let's see. Things are gradually coming back, so we've got a couple of Aussies. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. <laughs> coming to visit us as well. Now, I'd like to, when up here, point out some of the parts of the castle as well. Up here, on one part of the castle, you'll see the half moon battery. It's a shape like a half moon. But it's the windows next to it that are of particular interest. There's a window that's blacked out in particular. So when you come to Edinburgh, and if you want to steal the crown jewels, that's where they keep the crown jewels, but don't let the people in the castle know that I told you. Now, it is iconic. The castle sits on top of a, a volcanic plug. Edinburgh has various volcanic plugs. We have the seven hills of Edinburgh. All are volcanic in their nature. And if we get a little bit later, we'll be able to show you the plug, the volcanic plug in which it stands. And if you're up here, it's strategically really important because you get a great view for as far as the eye can see. On a day like today, your eye can't see very far because the mist has come down. But we are promised that this would lift. Let's take a little walk down to the south side of the Castle Esplanade. Now if we can move over to this side here, Mike. We'll get some of the, again, beautiful architecture here in Edinburgh. Remember, look at our, the umbrella I've um, got here, the Scottish Tour Guides Association. Mike and I are both Blue Badge Guides from the Scottish Tour Guides Association. Now I like to show some of the architecture here in Edinburgh, especially from the castle. There's two buildings I'd like to point out in particular. And one of them is a red building which will be coming into focus. This is the Edinburgh School of Art. Now one thing I forgot to mention before is that Mike is an artist. And you can see some of the stuff on his website if you go to Piping Scott Tours. He also plays the bagpipes and I promise you we will get Mike to play the bagpipes on one of our broadcasts. Now if you look at the red building there, this is the Edinburgh School of Art. And it's famous because it's associated with one of the famous sons of Edinburgh. I'm sure you've all heard of Sean Connery. Yeah, Sir Sean Connery, James Bond. Some people say he was the best James Bond ever and hopefully you'll agree with me. Well, he, Sean Connery, grew up in this part of Edinburgh. He started his jobs really as a milkman in the city. He'd be delivering milk, but he was also a bodybuilder. But he had another job here in the Edinburgh School of Arts. Normally I test people and ask, well, what do you think he was doing here? You get the usual answers like janitor, etc., etc. However, he was a nude model. So I'm sure if you're in Edinburgh and you want to go and look at some pictures of Sir Sean Connery, you can phone up the art school and see if they'll get any, any spare drawings. I'm sure they'll be worth a few thousand or two nowadays. I'd like to mention some of the, the artists that, and also the authors that, that uh, lived and work in Edinburgh. Now, one of the authors I really like to mention is Muriel Spark. Muriel Spark is famous for many books, but the one that I really particularly like is The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie. Now, somebody said to me, are you not going to mention the story of the line that Maggie Smith comes out with when she's playing Jean Brodie? And she's talking about the castle, and she said it's from one of yon windows that Mary, Queen of Scots, lowered her infant son through a howling gale to safety. Well, I'm not quite sure of the veracity of that statement, because I don't think Mary, Queen of Scots, ever really did. But why let the truth get in the way of a good story? And when you're on tour with the Mike and I, when we go around Scotland with you, when you come over to Scotland, you're going to get something like the truth, the half-truths, and anything but the truth. We're going to make it entertaining as well as inf inf informative for you as well.
As we walk down a little bit further, have a look at the architecture over the side here. You can see we're really high up. Mike may be able to get in the castle rock we were talking about, the volcanic plug upon which the castle. Now you have to imagine trying to build a castle on top of this rock. The actual manpower that went in to do this, off stone. Unbelievable. And also it looks impenetrable, but actually people did manage to break the sieges in here and go in and recapture the castle. We had quite a troubled relationship with our neighbours down south, but we also had a few battles amongst ourselves as well. So it was taken over by the Scots and the English, the Scots and the English, the Scots against the Scots. It has a very bloody history. Mike will go into a wee bit more detail about that probably later on when we come back up to the castle. We're going to do a circular tour around the castle here. I want to pull you to another building over here. It actually looks like a castle itself. Hopefully you can focus on this one here. This is actually a high school. This is George Heriot's. Now George Heriot was a goldsmith to King James VI of Scotland. He was an extremely wealthy man. When James VI of Scotland became James I, he moved his whole entourage down to London. So George went down with him. He earned more and more money. He was a billionaire of his day. When he died, he bequeathed a lot of money to his children and his wives. I say wives because his first wife died. But he was still left with a fortune. The remainder of the fortune was bequeathed to the city of Edinburgh. He was a great, great philanthropist. The money was used to build this building here in the 16, early 1600s through the 1650. It was opened as a hospital for all of the orphans in Edinburgh. So the poorest of the poor were living in a palace in the middle of the 1600s. The school today also has some literary connections because this is a school that is said to have inspired J.K. Rowling's when she wrote her Harry Potter books. Remember, she was a single mother herself and she moved to Edinburgh and when she was walking through Edinburgh, she was walking through various places. We're going to take you further on one of our other tours. We're going to take you a lot closer to this building and we're going to take you into the cemetery as to where she got the names from the characters. Now, I haven't mentioned before, but Edinburgh was the first city in the world to gain the title of the UNESCO City of Literature because all the past and present authors it has a great history. It's also a world UNESCO site for both the old town and the new town. We will be doing some walks in the new town as well, so keep tuned to us and you will see the beautiful new town. When we talk about the new town, remember, they started to build it at the end of the 1700s. Now, some of the authors we have mentioned before, we've mentioned Robert Louis Stevenson, Walter Scott, and I mentioned Muriel Spark with J.K. Rowling, but the list goes on and on. And I mentioned the movie, The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie, but the book is good as well. But if you want a really good movie about Edinburgh, I would highly recommend The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie. It revolves around a teacher based in Edinburgh in the 1930s. And she has her own little set of favourite little girls. It's a girls' school she teaches in. And she calls them the Brodie set. And all of her girls are the creme de la creme. But another movie I would highly recommend is one called Sunshine on Leith. And it's a great movie. And it's a real postcard of Edinburgh. And it's very uplifting. I like to think of it as the Scottish Mamma Mia. And I can guarantee you, you'll be dancing around your living room by the end of it. It's one of these up, up, uplifting and you feel so positive afterwards. So I don't know where you get your movies from, but you can get them from Amazon or any other supplier. It's the Prime of Miss Jean Brodie and Sunshine on Leith. L-E-I-T-H. Leith is the port city of Edinburgh. Now normally in a clear day we'll be able to show you some of the other hills of Edinburgh but the mist has come down <coughs> but you can get a good panoramic of how it looks all higgledy piggledy. Now one thing I like to point out here and people see it quite often are the chimneys. It looks like something at Mary Poppins. The reason we have so many chimneys here is because each room in each house had its own fireplace. So your bedroom would have a fireplace, the kitchen would have a fireplace, the common rooms would have a fireplace, the every room. People would burn coal here. 
coal gives off a lot of pollution. Most of the buildings you see here in Edinburgh are built from local sandstone. The sandstone tends to be a little bit oily and it does absorb a lot of the smoke. This is why a lot of the buildings look black. There was a lot of industry in the, in the 1800s, 1900s here in Edinburgh, not so much now. So all of these industrial factories were pumping out lots of pollution, so the buildings were absorbing it. Indeed, with the smoke here, Edinburgh's nickname was Old Reeky, or Old Smoky. So we're moving out of the castle Esplanade. Again, I've mentioned before, please Google the Edinburgh Military Tattoo. It'll give you an idea as to the size of the stadium that build goes up in May and comes down in October. It's not just used for the military tattoo, it's also used for rock concerts. Um, I've seen a few here, I've seen Leonard Cohen here, I've seen Elton John play here up in the Castle Rock. It's a really good place to come in summertime when you get the weather for it. This is known as Cannonball House. It's called Cannonball House because it is a cannonball embedded in the wall of the house. So it's like living history. I always think it looks like the gingerbread house from Hansel and Gretel, the way it's all built. It looks like it's made of gingerbread. And I don't know if you can make out the cannonball, but if you look at the window to the left, you'll see the sign for the toilets. If you look to the window to the right of there, if you just go above the right side, maybe go up two feet, half a meter, you'll see there's a round cannonball embedded in the wall. Hence the name Cannonball House. Nowadays, it's a very, very nice Italian restaurant and it's run by the Contini family. I mentioned the Italian, uh, the Italian family who came here in the early 1900s. We've got quite a large Italian population here in Scotland, believe it or not. And uh, they opened up lots of lovely restaurants. This is owned by the Contini family. So if you're in the castle, you're looking for somewhere to eat, there's some nice restaurants all around the castle itself. One thing I would highly recommend when you come to Scotland is we have fantastic seafood. So if you like your langoustine, if you like your lobster, anything to do with the sea, it's lovely. Highly recommended. We also have great beef and we have great lamb. Scotland's larder is well worth it. Now, one of the attractions that a lot of people like to come to Scotland, of course, you can't come to Scotland without tasting the whisky. That's taken as red. Um, but here, at the top of the Castle Hill, we have the Scotch Whisky Experience. Now, this is a great little attraction. You actually sit in a little ride. It's actually half of a whisky barrel you sit in, and it takes you on a little, like a little Disney ride, and it tells you all about how whisky is made from the start to the finish. And at the very end, you have a whiskey tasting experience. There's also an, an avatar who walks you around. It's a great, and they have the largest collection of whiskey in one place in this building. It was an old school converted into the attraction. The whiskey collection was actually donated by a Brazilian aficionado. And I say to my every time I see that word aficionado, it reminds me of the Eagles in terms of desperado, so it's aficionado. But it's a great place to go um, here to get the whole whiskey experience. Now, one of the other attractions that I want to point out here is this building here. It looks like a castle itself with a turret on top. This is the Camera Obscura. Camera Obscura means dark room. It actually consists of six floors. It's the Camera Obscura and the World of Illusions. Now the Camera Obscura itself was built by women. Yay, let's hear it up for the ladies. Her name was Maria Teresa Short. Now she came from a family of lens makers and glass makers. And she knew the power of lenses. She knew what to do with it. And I'm talking back in the early 1800s. In 1831, she built her first camera obscura, not here, but actually on another hill in Edinburgh, on Carlton Hill. But she was there for 20 years, so she had a lot of trouble with the, the city council at the time. Um, you can imagine it, women weren't allowed to vote, very few women owned businesses. This is the oldest attraction in Britain that you had to pay to go into. So they actually tore down her first camera obscura, but she was not put off. 
Now, you have to imagine the part of Edinburgh she was in initially was very Presbyterian and very buttoned up. Camera Obscura is dark room. You have to go into the dark room. And it wasn't appropriate for young ladies to take men into dark rooms, especially in the heart of Presbyterian Edinburgh. In the old town, however, that was a different story. This is where we had opium dens. This is where all the ladies of the night worked. So they didn't think it was much of a problem. So she bought herself a house here. The house itself was built in the 1600s, owned by a chap called Lord Cockpen. She then built two or three floors on top, and she built the tower, the white tower on top. And she would take people up there. The idea is you have the lenses on top, it reflects an image of Edinburgh onto a table, and you have a 360 degree tour. We're going to go in there, we've got permission to go in, we're going to meet some people from the Camera Obscura. So Mike and I are going to take you in to the Camera Obscura itself. It's all marked, so if you have to make a few adjustments and a few changes for opening up. Yes, very much so. So um, we've got our markers all for our disc. We've got our sneeze guards all up at our tills. Uh -huh. um, our team are all wearing lovely face masks, as you can see. Um, we've got extra hand sanitizer at every entrance and exit to the site as well. Um, so we always had hand sanitizer, but we've more than doubled the amount around the site. Um, and we're also offering a pre-book ticketing system as well. So we're limiting the amount of people at one time. So it will allow more space for social distancing and for everyone to really have a good time and join their visit as well. Okay, so you've got a pre-book system. How many people do you allow in at a time? 15 people every 15 minutes. 15 every 15. Yeah. That's great. Now I've been explaining that there are six floors of fun here. I explained about the history about Maria Theresa Short. Opened in 1851. Yep. 53? Oh, wow, correction. I, I dated it. I, I dated it. I dated it a little bit there. Okay, 1853. And so it's the oldest attraction in Edinburgh that you had to pay money to come into it. Purpose built, yeah? And I'd say a big, big, big up for the ladies, because she, she was a, for quite a formidable lady. And I have to say, I understood that she died here as well. Uh, apparently, yes. Yeah. There's not actually many records about Maria, um, but from what we know, this was part house, part visitor attraction. So yeah, people she would have lived here as well as allowing visitors to come to see the Camera Obscura and her other scientific instruments as well. So. And I understand there's a few ghost stories to go with the building as well. well maybe one more for Irina. I've never seen anything myself, but... Um, Ghost stories, I, have, I have heard that there's a ghost named George. George? Yeah, yeah, just hovering around the building. I haven't seen him myself, but I've heard that some people have, so we don't know. So you come to, you can't have a, a building from the 1600s without having a ghost in it. It's got to be part of the parcel for Edinburgh. Can we take a wee look in? Is it possible? Uh, is it just the second floor? Then? No, just a just re, reception. Yeah, just for the... Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Now, I understand that the, the ticket system is that your ticket lasts all day. Not at the moment. Not at the moment. Because yeah, we're trying to limit the capacity and only letting in 15 minutes, 15 people for 15 minutes. So, no, at the moment, it's only you come in, you see the exhibits for about an hour and a half, two hours, and then that's it, I'm afraid. So okay. at the moment, it's not valid all day. But in normal circumstances, the ticket is a 24-hour ticket. Yeah, yeah. So when everything clears up, yeah, yeah, I remember that. It's always been one of the best attractions in Edinburgh for people to come to. It must be great working in a place where people leave very happily from. It is, it really is. I've been here for seven years now. So yeah, feeling quite happy, quite satisfied with everything that we do. So yeah. And also, also it's a little bit mind-blowing in places as well. It is, it truly is. <laughs> But I understand you're also supported by the university to try some new attractions here and some new exhibits. Uh, yes, yeah, we have been working with the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I'm not sure what the progress is at the moment because of the COVID, everything has kind of stopped, but hopefully it's going to pick up very soon. Okay. Well, that's great. Thanks for letting us in. I just Thank wanted you. to get a picture of this, the magic mirror here. Lots of happy places and the happy people in the queue. They can't wait to get there. Where are you guys from? Uh, You're local? Yeah. Well done. It's a wet day. It seemed like a good thing last minute. Yeah. <laughs> are you enjoying it, guys? You're going to have a good fun in here. Can we work anymore? It does. It's 
we're good there. So we're going to say thank you very much, and we're going to back on the street. Thank you. Thank you, Reina. Bye-bye. So, that was the Camera Obscura, one of the first attractions to open in the city again. Well worth a visit while you're here in Edinburgh.